as some of the children are still in the sanctuary today. I declare that every child that is connected to this ministry, to Rain Fire Church, I declare, God, that you would keep them, keep them holy. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that they would not love the world, but that they would have a love for everything that is connected to you. Father, give them a hunger for righteousness. Father, I pray, God, that they would be kept holy, that they would get married as virgins. Father God, that, that even now you would prepare the spouses of the children that are connected to this ministry. I pray against rape. I pray against molestation. I pray against addiction. I pray against immorality. I pray against a homosexuality. I pray, Father God, against every demonic spirit, the spirit of pornography, every, every demonic spirit that would come to destroy them. We dedicate them to you from the newborn, Father God, to the 20-year-old. Father, we just dedicate them to you right now. And we stand in the gap and we declare that they will fulfill their purpose. We declare that they will be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit at a young age. We declare that they do not belong to the world. They do not belong to the enemy. They belong to the Lord. I declare that they will prophesy. I declare that they will preach the gospel in their schools. I declare in the name of Jesus that they will not be caught into smoking drinking, alcoholism. I declare, Father God, that they will be leaders and not followers. I declare that they will be leaders and not followers. I declare that they will be leaders and not followers. I declare that they will be leaders and not followers. I declare in the name of Jesus that they will be leaders and not followers. God, in the name of Jesus, God, that they would be bold about their convictions. That they would be bold about their faith. I pray, Jesus, that you would reveal yourself to them even now. That you would be so real to them that no one will ever be able to convince them that you are not real. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're in agreement with me, just clap your hands this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 I am, um, I believe that I've changed since going to Africa and returning. I believe that I've changed. And we'll worship the Lord with our giving at the end of service. Um, I just want to talk to you from my heart this morning. Um, I believe that I have changed. I was um, eight days, more like five days or four days, in the country of Harare, Zimbabwe, Africa, um, in the city of Ruwa, where we have a sister church there that has been connected and under my father's covering for um, just about 20 years. And... One of the things that happens when you go to other countries is that you realize how sometimes we're majoring in the minors. You know what I'm saying? And I, I always, I pray that God will help us to keep Rainfire as a congregation that we major in what is major to God. That we really focus and care about what God cares about. Sometimes we're caring about things that God doesn't care about. Okay, so you know, we'll be like, oh, it's Kid Sunday, and okay, well, we still sit here and you know, and and not even understand. Wait a minute, God is speaking through them, and God is worshiping through them, and at the same time, God is depositing something in them. And so, as adults or as you know, the the, the church body, we we may focus on well, they, they don't have the best presentation, or they don't yet have stage presence, or they're not, you know professional yet or there you know because church kind of the church stage has kind of become you know almost like the grand maze it's like everything has to be perfect and everything has to be just in its place and and, and that's fine we believe in excellence but what does God want what does God want you know even when I began to pray for the children somebody else may say well, well that's that's not on that's not on the order of service we need to we need to stick to the plan. We need to stick to the order. But what if the plan or the order it, that he wants is yeah. not what's on the paper? Yeah. What if okay we we create a plan in order to be organized, but we have to have an openness to say, well, God, if, if you want to shift the plan, then we'll be open to shift the plan with you. Some Sundays that means that we're we're not going to go into the scripture because he wants us to worship him. Sometimes maybe like two Sundays ago, that means that we're just going to. Be on our knees and having personal conversations with God because that's what you need to do at that moment. There's going to be some Sundays that are going to be prophetic and God is just going to be speaking through his spirit. 
and he's going to be addressing things. Sometimes it's going to be spiritual warfare to tear down things that are binding God's people and establishing the will of God. Sometimes we're going to sit down and have a piece of paper and have a notebook and say, okay, today we're going to learn the word of God. And where, where is that flexibility? Where is that leaning on God's wisdom? Where is that willingness to say, God, however it is that you want to do it, that's what we want to do today. If that means service is 30 minutes, praise God. If that means it's two and a half hours, praise God. But who is the one that should determine? Right? I think even as individuals and as adults and as people, we get so stuck on what our thoughts are and what our plan is and what our desire is or what we think should be happening in our lives right now, that we totally miss the master plan. Because we're focused. See, God made you with a will. The Word of God says that, that we were created in God's image. The Word of God says that God blew life into Adam and he became a living soul. So that living soul has a will. That living soul has emotions. That living soul has desires. That living soul has plans. Because you're made in the image of God. You have the power to create. You have the power to plan. You have the power to organize. You have the power to, to set things in motion. But there are moments, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, there will be moments, if you call yourself a son of God, there will be moments that God is going to suggest his perfect will. And his perfect will is not always going to match your will. Because in Psalms it says we are gods with a little g. Which means everything that is in the Father God, capital G, is within his children. The offspring of a dog is what? A dog. The offspring of a chicken is a chicken. The offspring of God is we're not Jehovah God. But we are small gods, little g. That's why the power of life and death is in our tongue. We cre can create with what we say. That's why our faith can move mountains. That's why when we pray, that's why when we, when we can declare a thing, and it is so because we were made in the image of God. We are the sons of God. So ladies, you're the son of God because sons inherit and brother, you're the bride of Christ. See how that works? Yes. But because we're made in the image of God and the power of God, the nature of God. See, you are not this flesh. I'm not Puerto Rican. You're not black. You're not white. You're not Asian. You're not multicultural. You're not biracial. You are a spirit. Somebody say a spirit. Yes. For all we know, your spirit may be rainbow colored. <laughs> And we get so stuck on the packaging. Yeah. And we get so stuck on the space suit, whether male or female, bond or free, black or white, Greek or Jew, Gentile or Samaritan or whatever. And God is like, the real you is not even the texture of your hair or the color of your eyes or your height or your weight. The real you is the spirit man that lives on the inside of you that was made in the image of God. And so you have the power to plan and the power to create and the power to have your own will because God does not want robots. That's not what he does. That's not who he is. He has sons and daughters that he respects. It's like my daughter. I can put out two outfits for her and I'll say to her, choose one. She has the right to choose, but if she tries to choose something that is so outside of my will, I have to pull her back and say, that's not appropriate. That's not what we're doing. And God will watch over us. He'll watch over us. But there has to be an awareness to say, God, what is your will concerning this matter? What is your will concerning this service? What is your will? Luke 10, verse 27. Let's go to the word of the Lord this morning. This is one of the lessons that I share um, when I do women's mentorship classes. The I Am Complete Mentorship Institute. And I felt from the Lord to share this this morning. 
And so for some of you that have been through the Mentorship Institute, um, just enjoy it again. Okay? Luke 10 verse 27 says this. And mind you, I understand that you're not going to ever remember every single word I've ever spoken and every single scripture I've ever quoted to you. You're not going to remember verb verbatim. But my trust is, is that you will be planted here long enough that there becomes a, a consciousness or an awareness, that there becomes a, just a, a solid life of faith and doctrine within you when you put all the things that you have learned together in, into action in your life. Okay? Luke 10 verse 27 says this. He, said, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart. With all your soul with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And even while I was in Africa, one of the things that, that I kept thinking about, and mind you, I'm not gonna say that African people are better Christians than American people, or American people are better Christians. The pastors were talking to me as if you guys are saints. Well, these are the problems that we have with Africans, but I'm sure you don't have any of these problems in your church in America because their people are more honest and their people are, they don't, they don't come to church with wrong motivation and they're in America, and I'm looking at her like, who, 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 are you, who are you talking about? Which showed me the same issues that we have here with people are the same issues that they have there. But there are because of differences in culture, things that we can learn, things that we can um, receive. And one of the things that I, I kept, I just kept thinking about this, is that many times because as Americans that live in the United States, because we have access to so many things, we have access to cars, and we have access to money, we have access to food. Uh, even if you don't work, you can go and you can get food stamps. And you, you know, we have access to so many things that uh, for the majority of the time, our love is divided. Because we have access to so many things. Our need, even if you feel like you are having the worst year of your life, it still does not compare to the conditions of how some people live in third world countries. Okay? Where people are literally raising their families, eating out of the garbage every day, trying to find something to eat. I mean, that's the reality of some people's everyday life, where they lay down and... There, there is no siding and there is no windows and there's rats crawling across your chest as you sleep. Like this is the reality. This is the reality. And so because we have so much access to blessings and we have so much access to food and to clothing and to all of these different things that our love is divided. We love our car, we love our sports, we love our spouse, we love our children, we love, and there's nothing wrong with loving your spouse, there's, some, there's nothing wrong with loving your children, but when you love your children more than God, there's a problem. When you love your children more than you love God, there's a problem. When you love your spouse more than you love God, there's a problem. When you love money, more than you love God, there's a problem. When you when you love your clothing or your hair or your neck, oh well, I I I can't go to church because I I I, I need to get my new hairstyle put in. I, I can't go looking like this. Well, why not? Why not? Why 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 can't we just do some hat action or why can't we do a scarf or why 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 is it so much more important? For your hair to be a certain way and for your clothes to be a certain way, for you to come and hear from God. Why, why is it, why is it so important that, that well, I, I, I wore this, I wore this dress, you know, three weeks ago and I can't wear it again. Why, why not? Well, people gonna see me. Who cares? Put on some, some uh, pair of shorts and some flip flops. I, I don't care. If I don't care, why do you care? What we should care most about is 
having the opportunity to come together and, and, and be in the presence of God. What we should care about most is today I may be able to hear the missing link of what I need to change and shift in my life so that my life can line up with the will of God. I get to come and be among my brothers and sisters and love on them and encourage them to keep going and fighting the good fight of faith. But we major in the minors. We major in the things that God doesn't even care about. Because guess what? God doesn't care about what you have on it. God doesn't care about your makeup and God doesn't care about your hair and God doesn't care about your shoes. God doesn't care that you didn't get to the car wash yesterday and your car is filthy. But no, I'm not going to church with a filthy car. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. How, how do you know what you most love? Because when it comes time to decide between one and another, what you love is what is going to be chosen. What do I love more? Being in the house of God or sleeping in on Sunday? Whoever you love more is your God. So I guess for some of us, Bedside Baptist is our God. With pastor pillow and sister sheets. <laughs> because Sunday's my only day off. And I'm not going to get up early when I can sleep in on a Sunday. I need to rest. But you will send your soul to hell while you're resting your body. The body that's going to die on you. No matter how much you rest. And I'm not speaking against rest. I'm speaking about priorities. I'm speaking about perspective. I'm speaking about understanding. I'm speaking about our lives and our heart being in the right position and in the right place. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's your emotions. That means that if a man comes into your life or a woman comes into your life and they ridicule your faith and you start not being so emotional or not talking about spiritual things or not, not shouting when you get to church because they're, they're, they came with you and you don't want them to tease you after church, well, then that means that you just love that person a little bit more than, than, than you love God because you shouldn't care if somebody makes fun of you because you cry during worship. You shouldn't care that somebody makes fun of you because you want to shout and dance because you're so happy and thankful over what God has done for you. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That means if I have to choose between my friend and God, if you want to make me choose between my God and you, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Well, you went to church on Sunday. Why can't we just go to the movies on Tuesday? You don't have to go to Bible study. You always in church. Look, boo, I can see you Monday. I can see you Wednesday. I can see you Thursday. We can hang out on Friday if there ain't all night prayer. And hey, we still got Saturday. But don't ask me to give you what does not belong to me to give. Tuesday belongs to God. Sunday belongs to God. And I am not going to answer the phone before 7 a.m. Because between 6.30 and 7, that time is off limits as well. For my daily prayer and my time with God. See, but then we realize why we struggle. Then we were wondering why is it that some days my faith is up and some days my faith is down. You know why? Because some days you eat and some days you don't. Some days you pray, some days you don't. Some days you read the word and some days you don't. Some days you're giving thanks and other days you're complaining. Some days you're walking by faith, other days you're straight up walking by sight. And we wonder, why am I up sometimes and why am I down sometimes? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And with all your strength, he's not looking for a bride that half loves him. He's not looking for a bride that wants to sleep with other people and be with him. He's not looking for a bride that wants him sometimes. He's not looking for a bride that only comes to him when he or she needs a bill paid. He's looking for a bride that's committed. He's looking for a bride that will be there morning, noon, and night. He's looking for a bride that will worship him and honor him even when people are not looking. He's looking for a bride that is pure, without spot, without wrinkle. Without arrogance, without pride, without selfishness. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And I believe that God is allowing us to raise up a people that will love God. That is 
what my faith says. Because Rainfire is not the average church. You know why some people don't stay? Because they don't want to be confronted with themselves. And you know what? I'm okay with that. Because one day, I have to stand before God and He's going to ask me, did you love me with all your heart? With all, well, yes, God. No, no, you didn't. Because when I told you to, to confront them with themselves, you didn't do it because you wanted them to stay. Because you wanted your church to grow. Because you wanted people in the seats. So you loved them more than you loved the truth of my word. Do you see how that works? So the same way that you have to be accountable for your life, the word of God says that every action, everything that we do, everything, every message that I have ever preached, every song that I have ever sung, anytime, whatever it is that I have done, when I stand before God, God is going to take all of my works and he's going to put it into his fire. And in that fire, the motivation of why I did what I did is going to show. So if it burns up in God's holy fire, then that means I did it with the wrong motive and the wrong attitude. And I did it for the wrong reasons. But if it comes out as pure gold, God will know she did that for my glory. And she did that for my glory. She did this for my glory. And that is how I will receive my reward. See, we think, we think that as long as we're saved and we make it in, it's going to be all good because we all in. We in, guys. We got in. Yeah, we got in. But I don't want you to be shamed because sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, they got a crown because they were loving the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul. And, and you don't even have a herringbone necklace. Like you don't, you don't even have a string of pearls. Like you don't even, you don't even have a, a what are them things called? Like you don't even have a little, little tiara. Because you were saved, but you lived for yourself. You came to church, but that's as far as it went. You were saved, but that's it. That's, that's all I got for you. Look at the word of God. I'm going to go to Luke. Luke 14. And this is going to be kind of tough. But hey, you guys know I love you. So it's all good. Look at this. This is the Bible. <laughs> this is Jesus speaking. We're not even talking about Paul. We're not talking about the apostles. We're not talking about the disciples. We're talking about Jesus. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, it's a strong word, hate, father, mother, wife, and brother, children, sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? Hate is wrong. It's wrong to hate. Jesus, what do you mean that for me to be your disciple, I have to hate my mother and hate my father and hate my brothers and hate my wife and hate my children and hate my, my sisters? I have to hate my own life? What does that even mean, Jesus? Jesus is not, he, he's not promoting hate. He's trying to give you an extreme example for you to understand. I want, this is Jesus, I want your love for me to be so extreme that nothing else, that any, any love that you have for anybody else, it would look like hate in comparison. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You remember that scripture where he says, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, right? It's not that we're evil. He's saying my holiness in comparison to your goodness is still evil yeah. because I'm so holy. Yes. Does this make sense? So unless you hate your mother and your father and your sister, what does that mean? I will never forget. And I think I've, 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 taught, I've said this story before. It's obvious that I am my father's spiritual daughter. I'm his natural daughter. I honor him. I love him. I'm submitted to his, you know, his covering uh, as far as the church is concerned. Um, I, I carry his anointing. I carry his spirit. I just don't have the accent, but everything that he is, 
is who I am in a woman's body. I mean, that's why you come to Rainfire Church because of everything my parents sewed into me and taught me. And you'll be able to see that and understand that if you've never been uh, with him in a live ministry setting. And so I was in a service and I was in Chicago. There were people that I broke up with that I was dating because I refused to move from Chicago. We would be liking each other, we'd be interested in each other. When it would come down to it, they would say, well, I said, well, I'm not moving to Chicago, so if we're going to be together, you're going to have to move here because I'm not, literally, I, I broke up with people. Oh, wait, oh, they didn't want to move to Chicago. Well, I ain't leaving my daddy, so I guess we just not going to be together. And I remember being in service, and I was sitting, and there was just a powerful move of God that day. And for one, for one of the times in my life that I can tell you that I really heard the voice of God. Whew, makes me want to cry. I heard God say, do you love me? I said, yes, Lord, I love you. Do you love me? I said, yes, Lord, I love you. Then I heard him say, do you love me more than your father? I'm like, what does that even mean? I've been taught you're supposed to honor your father. You're supposed to submit to your father. You're supposed, especially in the Hispanic culture, like the honor, you know, like father, especially a man of God, father and God and prophet, you know, they're kind of synonymous. It's like, like, you don't, do, am I making sense to anybody? But, but the Lord asked me that. Do you love me more than your father? And I said, and with tears streaming down my face, I said, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, if you love me, then you must go. A few months later, I met Corey. And here I am living in Atlanta. People still mad at me because they're, oh, she couldn't move for me, but she moved for him. <laughs> but I heard God. At that moment, God was saying, if you are really going to walk in the purpose that I have for your life, you're going to have to choose me over the people that you love most. What I didn't realize is that four years later, God was going to ask my father the same question. And he asked my father, do you love me enough to leave your 10 grandchildren, your sons, your daughter, your church, every piece of property that you've ever acquired and go to a new country and start over? And proudly, I can say that my father's response was, yes, Lord. Because as a family... We believe in loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Even if that means that we don't get to spend every Christmas together. We don't get to spend every Thanksgiving together. I may have to FaceTime my parents more than actually seeing them face to face. And I don't get to touch them and be around them all the time. Does it hurt? Is it hard? Do I miss them? Yes. Do I wish we were all together? Yes. Is it a sacrifice? Yes. But if he was willing to shed his blood, if he was willing to wear the crown, if he was willing to die, if we was willing to come out of glory and put glory to the side and put on this nasty, stinky, earthly body, if he was willing to be placed in a woman's womb, if he was willing to be ridiculed and spat on and the spear put in his side. He was willing to be separated from his father so that we would have a way to be redeemed. You think he's sitting up somewhere crying because I can't be with my mama and my daddy every Christmas and every Thanksgiving? I'm sure he's saying, Joanne, get over it. You will be all right. You are working for the kingdom. And it's another level. It's another life. There are some of us that are still stuck in the same place because there are certain sacrifices that God has required that we have not been willing to make. Sacrifices of time, sacrifices of money, sacrifices of family, sacrifices of, well, I don't want to live there and I don't want to go there and I don't want to do that. And God has said it over and over and over again, not even understanding that by now you would have been like Abraham, living in the blessing and the overflow of the land which he called you to. Because the blessing is not where you are. The blessing is not always where you were raised. The blessing is where has he called you to be? Yeah. Thou shalt love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. With all. My prayer today, this morning, if you don't get anything else out of this service, is to be able to walk out of here and say, God, I, just, I need you to teach me how to love you the way Pastor Joanne is talking about. Because I don't know if I love you that way. 
I don't know if my love is, is where it needs to be. I don't, I don't know, God. I think that maybe there may be some areas in my life where I'm putting some, some, some things before you. Help me to see that. Because the hardest thing for us to see is ourselves. The hardest thing for us to see is ourselves. He said, such a person, if you cannot love me in this way, then you can't be my disciple. So maybe some of us are Christians, but not disciples. Ouch. But he wants disciples. Who wants to be a disciple? I want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Look at this, verse 27. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Carry my cross? What about grace? What about I'm saved now and I'm supposed to be living my best life? <laughs> My, the, the, my best days are yet to come, right? It's a season of favor. It's a season, yes. All of those things are true. But some of those things come through the process of what? God is heavy. God, I don't want to deal with these people. Well, why I got to do right when ain't nobody else doing right? Well, they don't fast and they're blessed. Why do I have to fast? Carry a cross and follow me. Because I believe that in the last days there's a whole lot and a whole lot of people and they think, they think they're on the VIP list. They think that they're Jesus superstars. They think that they got it going on and they're going to get to the party and they're going to be a long line and they're going to go up to the bouncer and be like, what's up, I'm on the list. And the man going to look at the list and be like, mm, back of the line. You're not on the list. What? I'm supposed to be on the list. Me and Jesus are homies. Back of the line. You say he don't know you. You say, but you're in the back of the line. Because there are things that we associate spirituality with and Christianity with that is not what God is looking for. So there has to be a shift. The word of God says that the latter rain will be greater than the former rain. The word of God says that in the last days, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Our sons and our daughters are supposed to prophesy. We're supposed to dream dreams. We're supposed to hear from God. He said, greater works shall you do. He's, we should be laying hands on the sick and they recover. Our faith should be activated. We should be focused on winning souls and not just our own personal drama. See, we're caring about stuff that God doesn't care about. We're focused on stuff that God is not focused on. And if we really read the word of God, I mean, he'll tell you straight up. If you love me, do what I say. You say you love me. You say you love me. If you love me, then keep my commandments. Well, God, what you're asking for is a little unfair. Why, why, do, why do I have to leave my family? And why do I have to move to another place? And, what, and honestly, when I heard God say that, I thought he was just saying that I was going to have to travel more because of ministry. I did not think that meant I had to relocate to a whole other city. To a whole other state where I knew nobody. Where Corey was working very, very late hours and I found myself alone a lot of the time because he was on the radio from like 6, you know, 5, 6 p.m. until midnight. And so here I am in a new city, not knowing anybody, no home church, no family. No, I lived like four doors down the street from my day. Like literally. Have you ever seen my big fat Greek wedding? That's my family. And we all live on the same street. And God was like, no, that's not what I'm calling for. Take up your cross. Follow me. But you know what? My cross has made me grow. My cross has made me strong. My cross has increased the anointing on my life. My cross has helped me to be more bold and more confident than I ever was before. My, my cross has helped me to, to face some spirits of low self-esteem that I had since I was a little child. I can't do that. I can't do that. But the weight of my cross, see, God knew. God knew how heavy my cross needed to be in every season. And he made it just heavy enough to challenge me but force me to grow. And there were times where I was growing and I was kicking and screaming, but I was still growing. Because he says, take up your cross and follow me. Because if you don't, you cannot be my disciple. Yeah. 
Luke 6, verse 46, and I'm going to be done. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? We can stop right there. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even if it's not popular. It's what the Bible says. Why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do? I told you don't forsake the assembly, but you don't come. I told you bring your tithe into the storehouse, but you don't do it. I told you to love your enemies, but you're still holding on to foolishness from 1982. I told you to walk in love, but you're not doing that. So why do you call me Lord? Why do you say Lord, but you don't do what I say? Stop lying. I'm not your Lord. See, because we live in a democracy, we don't understand what Lord means. See, if you, were, if you were raised and born maybe in Britain or somewhere where there is, you know, uh, that type of government where there's a king and there are subjects, then even especially in the medieval times, like you would understand that whatever the king, whatever the Lord said, whether you liked it or not, that's it. Okay, we're having liver and that's what we're all eating for dinner. So sit down. We're not going to make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is not a democracy. Sit your tail down because we're having liver. That's what the Lord said we're doing. And guess what? We understood that as subjects, we had to align ourselves with the instruction of our Lord. See, but because we live in a democracy, we think that when our Lord speaks, we can go to the, to the, uh, to the ballot and we can vote yes or no. God comes and he speaks to you. This is what I want you to do. Oh, well, let me see. Let me see. Lord, do I really want to do this? Well, maybe I'll check yes. Maybe I'll check no. And, and, and God is sitting there looking at us like, hello? This is, okay. Go ahead. And then you check no. And you go on about your business. And you find yourself in a mess. And then you're saying, God, why did you let this happen to me? And he's like, boo, why didn't you listen to me in the first place? I did it. I've done it many times. And woke up and said, how did I get in this mess? But he's the Lord. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. If you hear the word of the Lord and you put it into practice, if you hear the words of God and put it into practice, if you hear God speaking to you through a prophet, through your pastor, through an evangelist, through a brother or sister, and you know when God is talking to you because you get nervous. You know when God is talking to you because you're like, ooh. Yeah, she's on my street today. And you trying to look everywhere but at me. And then service ends and you get out the door before I come and shake your hand or hug you because you don't want me to look you in your eyes. Right? It's okay. You say, well, if I can get out of the building quick enough, maybe I can forget what I was challenged on. Maybe I can get wrapped up in something else and I don't have to think about the fact that God requires change from me. Then maybe if I can get out the door fast enough, then I can ignore the fact that God has been dealing with me in this area and I've just kind of just been putting it on the back burner because I'm just not ready to commit like that. I remember when my parents kept trying to get me to lead worship and I was like, ah, nah. Because I wasn't ready to be committed spiritually. I wasn't ready to have to pray I wasn't ready. I wanted to be able to go to school and act like the other girls. I wanted to be able to go to school and, you know, and pretend this and this and that and whatever, whatever. I wanted to be able to go to school and just, you know, just melt in with everybody else. I didn't want to have spiritual responsibility. So they were like, you're going to start singing with the worship. No, 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 no. And I was forced to. I was forced. You're going to sing. Well, I, I left my track at home. I don't care. You can sing acapella. <laughs> and people would be in worship, and I would be standing on the stage, I promise you, before, and I was like this. Looking at other people through the cracks in my eyelids, because I had no relationship with God. I had no relationship with God. 
That's my, my that's why my prayer is for our babies, God, that they would have a, re a real relationship with you at a young age. Why? Because the days get more and more evil. I don't want them to wait as long as I did to have a real relationship. Because there are certain heartaches that I could have avoided. And of course, you want better for your children. Look at this. He says, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep. See, when you come to the house of God and you have a pastor that loves you, the word sometimes makes you uncomfortable. The word makes you feel confronted. But if you're going to have a solid house, if you're going to have a solid life, then that means that sometimes we got to dig deep. Sometimes we got to get all up in your mess. Sometimes we have to confront your laziness and your lack of consistency in your relationship with God. Sometimes we got to confront your yo-yo your, your lifestyle up and down. Sometimes we got to deal with the ugly stuff. It's the same thing as I'm sure that when you're trying to lay the foundation of a house, it is very difficult. Why? Because you're getting that garbage out and you're getting out the dirt and some of that dirt gets compacted and it's hard and you got to sweat and you got to break through that dirt and when you're getting through the dirt then you got the, uh, the roots of the oak tree that's across the street all up in the dirt and you got to break a sweat going deep down. Why? Because you don't want to just lay the foundation without getting to a solid bedrock. So some of us, we're just trying to lay a foundation because we want a pretty house and we want to look good on the outside. But the first wind comes into your life, your first trial, and guess what? The evil day comes to everybody. You've heard me say it. As much as I love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, I've had four miscarriages, I've been through some lack, I've been through some trials, I've been through some storms in my life, I've been through, look, let's just even, hello, car accident, your husband almost died. Like, are you serious? The evil day comes to everybody, to everybody. But when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, your emotions, and you've done what he's told you to do, and you have set your foundation on the rock, and you've been a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word, those winds come and they blow, but you remain unmoved. You remain unchanged. You may cry. You may suffer. You may hurt. You may say, God, I don't understand what's going on. But even just like a palm tree, you're getting blown back and forth. But your roots yeah. are unmovable. Yeah. So you don't stop coming to church or you don't stop believing God because somebody flipped you off in the, in the parking lot. Well, I, I was offended by the usher. She didn't smile. So I'm not, I, I, I'm just, I'm just through with God. What God do to you? Nothing but send his son and love you and forgive you of your mess every time you come back to him and say, please forgive me. Yeah. He ain't done nothing to you. Well, it didn't go my way. Well, nothing goes everybody's way all the time. For nobody. Even the people that have the most money, their life does not always go the way that they want it to go. God did not promise us a life that's going to go exactly the way we want it to go every time. But what he did promise is that all things work together for the good. So you get stronger and you get smarter and you get wiser and your anointing begins to flow. And sometimes you got to go through some stuff just to learn how to be compassionate. Because sometimes we can be so judgmental of other people's lives and of other people's situations until you find yourself in that same spot and you say, oh my God, I never knew that it was this hard. And now you have a different, a different, um, just an avenue of ministry because you're compassion. The word of God said that Jesus looked at the multitude and had compassion on them. His healing ministry flowed, not just because of his faith and his power, but because of his compassion. You see what I'm saying? So God is forming us and God is working in us. Verse 48, they're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. It was well built. When you love God, when you get to know God, 
When you're consistent getting to know God, when you're consistent doing what God is asking you to do, he is teaching you how to build a life that is solid and well built. You want a life. See, having a life that is well built is not based on you being married or being single. Having a life that is well built is not based on you having money or not having money. Having a life that is well built is not about you having a career or not having a career or you having the honor of people or not having the honor of people. Having a life that is well built is building your life on the rock of the relationship that you have with God because he is the only one that is unchanging. He is the one that will order your steps. He is the one that will show you where you need to go and what you need to be doing and he will bring you into such a place of fulfillment and success that is not connected to people, is not connected to money, is not connected to position. It is connected to your purpose and understanding I am exactly who I'm supposed to be. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And the, and the deepness of that satisfaction, yes. I cannot even explain to you just how satisfied. See, but you're not satisfied and you're looking and you're trying. And well, maybe if I try this and maybe if I date them and maybe if I go here and maybe if I buy this and maybe if I wear that and maybe if I lose 20 pounds, I'll feel better about my life. You know what? You'll fit your skinny jeans and still be miserable. Yeah. Even though it's nice to fit your skinny jeans. But it doesn't change you on the inside. God wants us to live a life that is well built. But it begins with loving him. Loving him. Loving him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. When the decision has to be made between him and something else or someone else that he would always win. It's amazing how... I've shared with you guys my brother getting saved and just what God is doing in his life. And I mean, I, I, talking to him, I felt like I had to have a notebook because God is just revealing so many things to him. And he said to me, he said, Joanne, he said, do you realize that the vision, whatever you're looking directly at is, is perfectly in focus. He said, but in your peripheral, things get blurry. He said, if somebody is in your extreme peripheral, there could be a man that is dressed like a woman, but because it's in your peripheral, you will swear that it's a woman until you turn and focus on it and see, wait a minute, that's a man dressed like a woman. Because what's in your peripheral vision is not clear. What you focus on is what's clear. For some of us, our relationship with God is in our peripheral. Because we don't love him. Like we say we love him. You call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. So he's in our peripheral. And everything else is what we're focused on. We're focused on all the things that should be in our peripheral. See, Jesus is the one that should be the center of our focus. The Father's will should be at the center of our focus. The Holy Spirit should be the center of our focus. And everything else should be in the peripheral. Because when you're focused on him, have you... okay? So do you know how when it's time for Christmas and you are wrapping gifts and you start cutting the paper and when you get to the end, you, you swear you cut it straight. I got some witnesses in the room. But then you pick up the paper and it's cut like this. It's slanted. Because some, somewhere while we were cutting, we got offline where well, we didn't even realize it. That's why they started making the paper, the wrapping paper with the grid on the back. Mm, mm, mm. To keep us what? Straight. That's what happens with your life. When Jesus and the Father's will and the Holy Spirit are the center of your focus, they're your true north. They are, they're the one that keeps you in line. They keep, see, because they, they designed you. They made a plan for you. They have a purpose for you. You were designed to do things. You were designed to say things. You were designed to love certain people. You were designed to do God's will. It's not that God is forcing you to do something. It's that he created you to do something. And until you start doing what you were created to do, you're going to feel frustrated because he made you a hammer, but you're trying to saw some wood. 
Does that make sense? When you start being who he created you to be, you feel fulfilled. But everything else has to be in the peripheral and he has to be in the center. The one who hears my words, I'm done here, and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the storm hits the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. The moment the storm hit the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. That's why some of us, when life hits us, we feel like we've had to start over so many times. Because when the storm hit, it hit us so hard that it's almost like it destroyed everything. Your finances were destroyed, your relationships were destroyed, your career was destroyed, your family was destroyed. It seems like everything, just everything was destroyed. And you feel like you've had to start over so many times. And God is saying to you, the storms of life will come and go. But if you learn to make me your focus, if you learn to make me your anchor, if you learn to make me your bedrock, if you learn to just build your house on me, if you learn to really understand what it is for me, not just to be your savior, but to be your Lord, and you do what I ask you to do, then your house is going to be solid. Your life is going to be solid. And when the storms come, not if, when they come. You know, the roof may tear off a little bit. The shutters on the outside of, of your building may fall off. Just think of the story of the three little pigs. All your shrubbery may be stripped and it looks crazy, but the actual building, the decorations may fall off, but the actual building of your life will still be intact. And people will be able to look at you and say, how, how could you go through the death of both of your parents in the same year, but you still giving glory to God? How could you lose your job, but you still say God has his hand on your life? How can you lose your son, but you still say that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think? How is it that you could go through a divorce and your wife left you and, and, and went and played you dirty and you can still say that God is a good God and that he's blessing you? I don't understand it. And you'll be able to look at them and say, my house is built on a rock. Because I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my might, with all my strength. He is the most constant thing in my life. I may have to turn my back on everything and on everybody, but on him, I never will. Because he's been more faithful to me than I've been to myself. Would you bow your heads with me? I feel such a strong anointing and presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. I feel such a strong presence and power of the anointing. Holy Spirit, we humble ourselves before you today. Father, there have been times when we have not known how to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, with all our strength. We haven't known how. Father, there have been times when we've chosen others over you. We've chosen things over you. We've chosen relationships over you. I ask God that as, that as a body of believers, as a church family, that we would learn to put you back in the position and the place that you deserve. As the head of our lives. As the Lord of our lives. You said it so clearly in your word. Don't call me Lord and, and not do what I say. As I always pray, God, give us an ear to hear your voice. That it would be clear what you're saying. That it would be clear what you want. That what you desire from us, that it would be clear, Father. And that we would be able to do it, God, without hesitation. That we would be able to do it, Father, in full confidence that we hear you. That we would be truly submitted vessels to your will. God, we don't want to keep building our house on a ground that has no foundation. We don't want the storms of life to come and our house is completely destroyed and we have to start all over. That's, that's not your will for us. That's so much more painful. It's such a hard process. 
But Father, we want to truly learn. I declare in the name of Jesus, God, that every person, God, that you have assigned to this house. God, I declare that they're coming into a greater season of consistency. In every area of their lives, God, consistency in their relationship with you, consistency in their faith, consistency in their prayer life, consistency in their fasting, consistency in their obedience. God, some of us are fasting and praying and, and, and doing all of the religious activities, but then when it comes to the moment of obedience, we just don't do it. Give us a heart to obey. Give us a heart to obey. Would you lift your hands with me and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, give me a heart to obey. Help me hear you clearly. I don't want to go back. I don't want to start over. I want to be solid, well built in Jesus name. Would you keep your eyes closed? If you have not given your heart to Jesus Christ, if you are not saved, if you're not in right standing with God, I encourage you to take advantage of this moment. Some of you are living in a house that is falling apart. Your life is falling apart. Your life is falling apart because you have not placed God in the center of your life. And if you know that I'm talking to you, I'm not going to ask you to come up, but I just want you to slip your hand up and I just want to see you. I just want to see your hand so I know who I'm praying for this morning. You feel like your house is falling apart. Raise it high. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. Everybody's eyes closed and head bowed. Raise that hand high and keep it high. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for the honesty and the openness. Everybody now lift your hands because I don't want anyone to feel singled out. Say with me, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I repent of my sin and I declare right now the forgiveness of my sin Jesus cleanse me of all sin be my Lord and my Savior and help me to build my life on the rock of a real relationship with you in Jesus name amen if you pray that prayer At one point during the service, I'm going to say, do we have any first-time visitors? Even if you're not here for the first time, I want you to raise your hand anyway. Put your information on a card and just write a little note on there that says, I pray that prayer today. Because we want to be able to just give you support. Reach out to you, check on you. Nobody can make it by themselves. Nobody can make it by themselves. And you need to be poured into. You need to be encouraged. You need to be spoken into. You need to be prayed for. I will be praying for you this week. Okay? So if we do have any first-time visitors, I want to welcome you. If you're a first-time visitor, please raise your hand. If you need a card, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being Come on, let's welcome you. Let's make sure that they have a card. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being here this morning. And while we're doing that, we want to worship the Lord with our giving. We want to bring to the Lord our tithe and our offering. We believe in just bringing to the Lord out of love because we love God. In his word, he asks us to bring him our tithe and our offering. And we believe in that here at Grand Fire Church. And I don't say it because, oh, we need to pay the bills. Give to God because we need to pay the bills. I'm not going to say that. We give to God because we love him. We give to God because we're grateful. We give to God because we believe his word. God pays his bills. He'll send it from somewhere. But this moment gives us an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom and to activate the favor of God and the blessing of God in the resource area and the financial area. Amen? And so if you need an envelope, raise your hand. One of the ushers will give you an envelope promptly. If you can fill that out clearly, we, the office <laughs> would really appreciate clear writing so that we have your accurate information, your accurate email. Please fill it out completely. You can put your debit card information on there. And we also have our text to give. 
which is texting Rainfire, the word Rainfire, to the phone number 77977. It's an easy way to set up push pay to give electronically on your phone. I think that's why that song hit me so hard because I knew where I was going with the word and it was just glorified because you don't want people to look at your life and be like oh she's shaming God <laughs> he is shaming God you want people to look at our lives and say wow God is a good God if you're ready to give I'm going to ask you to stand up to your feet as I bless your seed You've heard me say this before. Your offering and your tithe is something natural that God has given you that moves supernatural things. Supernatural things is what cannot be seen, what you cannot see with your eyes, the things that are invisible. There is an invisible world that exists all around us. It does. In the same way that prayer is something that's invisible, but it has the power to move mountains. It has supernatural power. Your giving has supernatural power. If you gave my phone, I'm going to ask you to just lift up your phone. If you have an envelope, you can raise your envelope. If you have nothing financial to give, I don't care. Lift your hand because you're the greatest seed that God wants. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the sons and the daughters that you have given us in this house. I thank you, God, that they have an open heart to be challenged by the word of God to take their relationship with you to new heights and new levels every day. I pray, Father God, that no one would leave this place discouraged.